Hey everybody, David East here from the Firebase team at Google and on today's episode of Firecast, we're going to look at Firebase events. I'm going to teach you the two main types of events in Firebase and then after that we're going to learn about the Firebase UI library which is going to save you a lot of time. So let's get started. So here in Android Studio, I'm starting with this main activity that has two UI components, a text view and a list view. And the goal is I want to synchronize this messages node to the text view. So every time this value changes, it will reflect the text view's value. So down in on start, I'm going to create a reference to the messages node. And I can do that with the root ref property by calling dot child messages. So the root ref property points to the root of the Firebase. So by calling dot child on the root ref points out to the messages node. And now that we're connected to that node, I'm going to write add value event listener and pass in a new value event listener. So essentially what's going on here is we created a reference out to the messages node and then we pass through a value event listener with a value event. And the way the value event works is, is that every time the value changes at messages, it's going to fire off the on data change method with a new data snapshot. And the data snapshot is how I'm going to get the value back. So I'm going to get the value back as a string by calling data snapshot dot get value and get value returns data as an object. So it's not going to work to store this as a string unless I pass through string dot class, which tells the SDK to cast it to a string. And now that it's a string, I'm just going to log it to the console. So when I run the app, you can see that the value event prints with the value hello which is what we would expect. So let's actually go and change the message value. So instead of hello, change it to like hello world. And you can see down here in the console, a value event of hello world prints. So that's pretty awesome. All we really had to do is change this data and it fired off the on data change method, which logs it to the console. So now that we have the value event wired up, we want to set the text view every single time the value changes. So I'll tap into the text view and then call set text with the new message. So now I'm running the full on app rather than just the console down here. And you can see in the text view that my original value is synchronized from the Firebase database. So now I'm going to change it to a more modern greeting like what's up. And now when I save that, it synchronized to the text view. So we know that happened because it fired off on data change when it was updated, therefore updated the text view. So the value event is great for synchronizing primitives and objects, but if you want more fine grained control over your data synchronization, you'll need to use child events, which works great for stuff like lists. So let's go and dive into that. So the value event works really well when you're trying to synchronize a primitive, but it also works really well for objects. So rather than a primitive, we could have a whole list of properties right here. And then every time one of these properties changed, we could get the object updated in on data change. So let's remove the messages node and let's add an actual object. So instead of clicking add child, I'm going to click add JSON so I can add an object. And so I'll give it the key of messages and it's just going to have two sort of stub properties. Hello, which will have a value of hello and world, which will have a value of world. And then when they save, they appear in the Firebase database as properties. So I'm no longer synchronizing this message. I'm actually synchronizing this entire object. So I'm going to have to delete this data and use a map rather than a string. So I'm going to delete this code right here because we need to create a map. And the map is going to be of type string string. And a map of string string works because our key is a string as well as our value. So we'll get the value from the data snapshot and we have to pass through map.class to get it back as a map. And then now we have the map, we can get each individual property by calling map.get and pass through the key. So the key for hello and then do the same for world. So map.get world. And then now we can just log it out to logcat and we can just concatenate the two together. 
So now we're running down here in the console and you can see that it has hello world, which makes sense because our object has two keys of hello and world. But now let's go and actually modify one of these. So let's go modify hello, I'll change it to what's up. And then when I save, something actually really interesting happens. We get back both what's up and world. Now what's really important to know about this is that I changed the value of hello. So I changed it from hello to what's up. And then this fired off on data change. And I didn't just get back the newly changed value, I actually got back the entire object. And that is what the value event does. When any change happens, it gives you back the entire object. And you can see this too even when you delete items. So if I remove hello, you see null world because we deleted the hello key. So when we call map.get, there is no hello value anymore. So the value event works great for objects and primitives because it gives you back the entire updated object. But for lists, you might want a more granular level of control. So instead of treating this messages node like an object, we can start thinking of it as a list. So each property underneath is actually an item. So let's add another item and we'll just add back in the hello key. And now we have two list items. And since we're no longer using the value event, we can just actually delete all the value event listener code and add in a child event listener. So this is a lot like the value event, but we're just calling add child event listener. And as you would expect, it does take in a new child event listener. You might be thinking like, wow, this is a lot of events, but it's actually pretty simple. So to take it from the top, we start with the messages ref, which we know points at messages. And then when we're calling the child event listener, we get several child events. So we have child added, child changed, child removed, and we also have child moved. I'm not gonna cover child moved because that has to do with querying, which we will get into in a later video. But by using these, we can actually detect when events happen inside the children of the messages list. So we'll start by covering child added. So you probably expect that child added will get called for every single child added. But the thing to know is that child added also gets called for every initial item and then also every subsequent added child. So in this case, it would fire off for the hello key and the world key. And if we kept adding children, it would fire off for each one of those as well. And when you are getting back the snapshot in child added, it's for the child. So when we're getting back the data, we know we're gonna get it back as a string. So I can create a string for the message and then data snapshot dot get value with the string class. And then just log that right to the console. So child change is fairly straightforward. When any of these children change in value, fire off the child changed event with the new data snapshot, which contains the new changed value. And since the data snapshot is also at the child level, it'll come back as a string. So we'll just copy and paste the code from above and change the log tag. And as you probably guessed, child removed fires off when we would remove any child and the data snapshot is the data that was removed. So copy and paste the code from above and change the log tag. And like I said, we're just gonna ignore child move for now. So when we run the app, we get two child added events, hello and world. And that works within the confines of child added because child added fires off for each initial item underneath the parent node, messages. So now if we go and add another child underneath messages, that will fire off in the console. And as you see down here, we have another child added event of our super cool value. And now if we go and edit one of these values, we get another event and this time it's a child changed because we changed the value. So it fires, it fires off child changed, which logs it. And just to test remove, when we delete it, child remove fires off and with the removed value. So it's all pretty straightforward as you would expect. So now we know how each child event works. And what I'd like to do is take this data right here and bind it to a list view. 
So if we go to the top of the activity, you can see up here that there is this array list of string that can hold a list of messages. And it would be great to take this messages array list and create an array adapter that we can then set on the list view. So every time child added gets fired, we add a new message. So now we'll just go and create an array adapter. And the array adapter will hold a string and we'll make sure to pass in the context. And as the layout, we're going to use one provided by Android. So that's simple list item one. So that's one that we don't have to create ourselves. And then as the last parameter is just the messages array list. Then we'll set the adapter and we're almost ready to run. The last thing we need to do inside on child added is call adapter.notifyDataset changed. So essentially every single time a child is added, we'll add it to the messages array list, which will update the adapter, which will go through and update the list view. So now I'm running the app and you can see that the app has the hello and world values in the Firebase database. So now I'm gonna go and add a new item. And you can see that the new value is added at the bottom. But what you might notice is that the order of the list view is different than the order of the Firebase database. And there's actually a pretty simple explanation for it. And the reason why they have different sort order is that the Firebase database is sorted lexicographically by key. So A comes before H and H comes before W. And what I'm doing inside of child added is, is as each child is added, add it to the messages array list. So the first two children were hello and world. Then I added this another key, which lexicographically sorts to the top with Firebase, but it just simply gets added to the messages array list, so therefore it gets put on the bottom. And depending on what your app needs, this is totally fine to do. You can just push messages on as they get added. And most of the time when you're dealing with lists, you're not going to be using your own keys. You're going to be using the Firebase generated push IDs which have a chronological component to them, so you'll always have your keys in correct order. So now I'm gonna to try to actually change one of these child values. So I'll edit another value to awesome value, and you can see that it did not change. And that's because we're not doing anything for child changed. In fact, the only way you can really get the child to change right now is if you go and restart the app. So with the app restarted, we have awesome value on the top because it fired off for each initial child and we have our new value. So if you wanted to get child change to work and child remove for that matter, you would have to get the new data back from the snapshot and then update it in line inside of the array list. So you'd have to find where it exists inside of the array list. So that actually can be kind of complicated because at this point you're managing an entire synchronized array. So rather than do that yourself, you can use the Firebase UI library. So we're gonna go install Firebase UI, but first I'm going to delete all of the child listeners because Firebase UI handles all of this for you. So to set up Firebase UI, I'm gonna open up the build.gradle file. And you can see down here at the bottom, we have the dependency of Firebase UI. And so this is all you have to include and you're ready to go. So Firebase UI comes with a Firebase list adapter, which when you pass it a messages ref will actually handle all of the child event synchronization for you. So we'll create a Firebase list adapter and we're going to give it the type of string since our messages are stored as strings. And when you create a new Firebase list adapter, you get this populate view, which helps you create your view when data changes happen. But we'll cover that after we finish constructing the Firebase list adapter. So the list adapter takes in a context, your model class, so in this case a string, the resource, so we're going to use the simple list item one again, and then the Firebase reference, which is the messages ref. So now inside populate view, we're going to get the text view and we can do that by getting the view.find view by ID and its ID is at the Android level and its ID of text view one. And with the text view, we can set its value. But what you probably don't see is a data snapshot anywhere, but we do see this string. 
And that's because we're setting the string for the Firebase list adapter. So Firebase UI actually unwraps the snapshot for you and then brings it back as this parameter. So we'll pass that string in and then we'll just set the list view to have the Firebase list adapter. So now I'll run the app and you can see that the list view matches the Firebase database. And now I can go and change the hello value and you can see that the item updated in place. And if we go and remove one, it removes it from the top. And now it's really cool. I'm going to add a key of another. And another is lexicographically sorted to the top in the Firebase database, as well as the list view. And this works because Firebase list adapter is backed by a Firebase array class, which synchronizes an array in the same order as the Firebase database. And all that is handled underneath the covers for you, so Firebase UI makes your life a lot easier. So that's everything for events in Firebase. And the key to know is that you should use the right event for the right situation. Or if you're binding lists, you should just really use Firebase UI. And if you liked Firebase UI, tune into next week's Firecast. We're going to cover that in a lot more detail. So thanks for stopping by, and we will see you next time.